Good afternoon and welcome to today's DBRS Morningstar Frontline Perspectives webinar. Today we're going to talk about Community Development Financial Institutions or CDFIs. My name is Yuri Kudnev and I'm a sector co-lead for non-QM RMBS at DBRS Morningstar. I'm joined today by my colleagues Karina Gonzalez and Mark Brenton, two senior analysts covering the CDFI sector here at DBRS Morningstar. Karina also co-leads the non-QM RMBS sector with me. Karina and Mark will present today's 101 on CDFIs. After our prepared remarks, we will open the floor for a Q&A with the audience. During the presentation, please submit your questions via the chat function on Bright Talk. Also, the PowerPoint presentation will be available for download after the webinar. Mark, can you get us started and give us an introduction on CDFIs? Thanks, Yuri. I'd like to further set the stage, noting we're really focusing on CDFIs in the private label securitization, aka PLS or non-agency RMBS market. We'll assume our audience is generally familiar with RMBS and mortgage securitization. Then we can focus on the intro of what is a CDFI and how they've become more relevant in RMBS today. That said, we need to get some terminology and background up front before we can dig in. The starting point is a CDFI fund creation of the Regal Community Development and Regulatory Improvement Act 1994, which operates under the United States Department of the Treasury. According to the CDFIfund.gov, the fund has a vision of an America which all people and communities have access to investment capital, financial services they need to prosper, and a mission to expand economic opportunity for underserved people and communities by supporting growth and capacity of a national network of community development lenders investors, and financial service providers. The fund uses a CDFI designation to enable institutions to direct public funds with investments of private capital. CDFI are non-governmental entities, which can include banks, credit unions, nonprofits, and venture capital funds. There's about 1,400 CDFIs today, and obviously many of these institutions and the products they offer exist outside of residential mortgages. Of course, the reason we're here today is that CDFIs can and do make residential mortgage loans, and some of these loans from certain CDFIs are showing up in the securitization space. Now I'll hand it off to Karina to discuss highlights of CDFI history. Thanks, Mark. You previously mentioned the CDFI fund was established in 1994, so CDFIs have really been around for quite a while. The first organizations to be certified as CDFIs were in 1997. Fast forward to 2014, the CFPB implemented the Qualified Mortgage and Ability to Repay rules as a response to the global financial crisis. These rules were designed to protect consumers from predatory lending practices and mortgage features. For ATR compliance, lenders must consider the eight underwriting factors specified in the rules. CDFIs, along with some other types of community-focused lenders, were allowed an exemption from the rules because of concerns that the application of the eight underwriting factors of ATR may restrict mortgage credit availability, especially for low to moderate income borrowers. In 2015, the US credit risk retention rules became effective and certain exemptions were allowed for sponsors of securitizations that included community-focused residential mortgage loans. 2019 saw the first CDFI loan in a PLS securitization. Since then, ongoing issuances have included notable concentrations of loans originated by CDFIs. In 2020, the CDFI fund put out a request for public comment on a potential revised CDFI application. In 2021, the first privately rated 100% CDFI RMBS was issued. In 2022, the first publicly rated 100% CDFI RMBS was issued. Also in 2022, as of October, the CDFI fund announced a pause on new CDFI applications through April 2023. Although the revisions to the application have not been finalized, the updates were meant to maintain the integrity of what it means to be a certified CDFI from a mission perspective and to provide the flexibility necessary for CDFIs to grow and to serve their target markets. 
Certain aspects of the proposed changes may incorporate restrictions on product types that CDFIs are currently allowed to lend in order to implement certain mortgage protections for borrowers. Thank you, Michael and Karina, for a very comprehensive overview. Um, so, Mark, what are the implications for including CDFI loans in securitizations? There's some important nuances to highlight. First step, we need to talk about the target market requirement for CDFIs. Remember, the focus of a CDFI is to provide services to people that, for a variety of reasons, haven't been able to benefit from traditional financial services. Because of this, CFIs have been given the flexibility to offer loans that might otherwise be considered non-standard. We'll touch back on this target market concept again, but it's important to note that not every loan originated by a CDFI needs to be a member of its target market. The majority, to be more specific, at least 60% of the loans or services do need to be given to the target members. However, the remaining proportions are able to be directed to any borrower regardless of their inclusion in a target population or community. So we'll touch upon the importance of target markets again a bit later. Let's get back to more of the unique aspects of CDFI-backed RMBS. As Karina noted in the timeline a moment ago, after the great financial crisis, there's an emergence of classifications requirements like QM and ATR, as well as the credit risk retention requirements, which have become part of the day-to-day -day landscape of the PLS market. However, CDFIs have been exempt from some of these restrictions. At this time, there are not QM style prohibitions against certain quote unquote affordability products. For example, IOs, balloons, and arms qualified at initially low rates are allowed. Now this might change in the coming revision, but for now these loans are on the table to be originated and to be securitized. Also, as Karina mentioned, ATR does not apply to CDFI loans. Historically, there were concerns that the ATR and QM requirements could restrict access to mortgage credit for low and moderate borrowers. The mission of the fund and the mission requirements of the CDFI themselves, along with representation by their target market constituents included on governing and or advisory boards, meant to place oversight and accountability to counterbalance these more flexible guidelines. Now let's talk about risk retention. Securitizers of RMBS, amongst others, are generally subject to the U.S. risk retention requirements. Once again, things are a little different for the CDFIs. As a baseline, we know that pools of qualified residential mortgages are not subject to risk retention and that QRM has been equated to QM. Thus, while prime jumbo securitizations are typically not subject to risk retention, the non-QM sector, while still subject to ATR, does require 5% risk retention. CDFI are neither fish nor fowl, and 100% CDFI pools are exempt from this restriction. This is because CDFIs are classified as community-focused residential mortgages, which are exempt from that rule. When CDFI loans are included in smaller proportions in the non-QM space, the 5% risk retention is reduced accordingly. Again, the recurring theme here is removing barriers to financial services and lending in areas that may otherwise go unserved. I think the final point I want to make now is that the CDFI designation refers to the originating entity, not the credit quality or features of any given loan. Thank you, Mark, for a good clarification about CDFI, particularly CDFI being an entity designation rather than a loan designation. Uh, which leads well into our next section. Uh, Karina, can you give us a comparison of CDFI transactions versus non-QM or MBS? Yes, sure can. So here in this table, we have a comparison of some of the features of 100% CDFI securitizations versus typical non-QM. Uh, we mentioned this a few times already. For ATR rules, CDFI loans are exempt. Non-QM must comply. Credit risk retention rules, sponsors do not have to retain any securities in a 100% CDFI transaction. Uh, for non-QM, sponsors must retain a 5% eligible vertical or horizontal residual interest in the deal. Securitization activity. Uh, the first RMBS with a sizable CDFI concentration was issued in 2019. Since 2021, there have been eight 100% CDFI deals issued. 
For non-QM, a little bit of a head start here with the first deal being issued in 2015 and the first rated deal in 2016. Since then, over 300 non-QM deals have been issued. Underwriting standards, so here CDFI lenders can have fairly expanded underwriting. Guides may allow for no income and employment documentation, but rather focus on credit, LTV, housing history, and reserves. For non-QM, at a minimum, lenders must consider the eight underwriting factors of ATR, which also includes income, assets, employment. Target market restriction, Mark mentioned this before, CDFIs must lend at least 60% of their production to target markets, whereas non-QM has no such restriction. Next slide, third-party due diligence, not too much difference here between CDFI and non-QM, generally the same across the two sectors. We've seen 100% sample size, it's not really a sample, it's a whole pool, for the subject pools, in the same review categories for credit, property valuation, and regulatory compliance where applicable. Regarding cash flow structure, we see two flavors in the CDFI space, full sequential pay with no triggers, and also the sequential pay with pro rata feature to the seniors, which is typical for the non-QM sector. For reps and warranties, we generally see a full slate and the frameworks are largely the same between CDFI securitizations and non-QM. Any references to ATR won't be found in CDFI rep and warranty frameworks. And also if there's certain items in the underwriting guidelines, like no income or employment, then you wouldn't see that in the reps either. On this next section regarding CDFI performance, I do have a big caveat here. Because 100% CDFI securitizations have not reached substantial volumes, the CDFI performance figures in the table represent limited data when compared to the non-QM performance data, which covers a few extra years and many more transactions. As of today, we find CDFI securitization performance to be generally in line with our expectations and will continue to monitor the performance of CDFI RMBS as the sector grows and matures. Thank you for a very detailed commentary, Karina. Uh, Mark, what is required for an institution to become a CDFI? Yuri, the institutions need to not only apply for a CDFI designation, but they need to recertify their status periodically. And the CDFI fund has temporarily paused applications for new CDFIs Will they finalize their review after the latest request for comments? Why don't we take a look at the basic criteria before we talk more about the new developments? Obviously, a CDFI needs to be a non-governmental legal entity involved in financing. But after the discussion of the expanded lines to reach the target markets, we really see the relevance of the mission, the community development, and the accountability desired by requiring the presence of the target members in the governing and or advisory boards. You know, these criteria can really help bring back that concept of skin in the game, given the close relationship with and the inclusion of members of the community. Um, now it is worth noting, there is a pause on the application for CFI designation, which is scheduled to come back online on April 3rd, 2023. The CDFI fund is preparing for the launch of the new application, new reporting and finalizing certain requirements after the review. In this time, they're going to continue to review the applicants that were submitted prior to the October 1st cutoff date. And it's also worth noting that existing CDFIs will be given a 12 month grace period to comply with any of the new and updated criteria. Thank you, Mark. Uh, now we know what institutions are eligible to become a CDFI. Karina, can you share with us what we know about the collateral quality and the credit analysis of the CDFI loans? Definitely. As Mark mentioned, the CDFI designation refers to the entity and not necessarily the credit quality or features of the loans originated by that entity. Consequently, like the non-QM sector, we do see a wide range of credit quality that spans from prime to non-prime. Different from non-QM, 
Because of the ATR exemption, lenders may qualify loans that do not require borrower income and employment, but rather rely on credit score, borrower equity contribution, housing history, and liquid reserves. However, on the flip side, we've also seen CDFI loans originated in consideration of ATR, even though the CDFI lender doesn't have any obligation to do so. In the transactions DBRS Morningstar has rated, which contained large portions of CDFI loans, we've seen trends of near prime FICO scores of 730 to 740, low LTV ratios of 60 to 75 percent, and robust liquid reserves covering 40 to 70 months of PITIA. Depending on the CDFI lenders contributing loans to a pool, we may also see elevated concentrations in certain geographic locations like California, Florida, or Texas. Since CDFI loans are exempt from ATR, in our analysis, we do not apply any loss severity adjustment for potential failures to comply with the rules, which we would apply for non-QM loans. In considering probabilities of default, our analysis very much relies on the fundamental loan characteristics. Certain documentation and product types, such as no income or IO loans, will naturally be penalized in our model. But if a pool has a good LTV and FICO, that will help to offset less desirable features like low doc types or low DSERs. For pools comprised entirely of loans with expanded documentation types, we may apply additional penalties, such as slowing down the CPRs and assuming all loans that go delinquent will default. Thank you, Karina. Uh, and just to maybe further that point, um, as we know, there's been a lot of interest in CDFI and loans. Uh, what is DBRS Morningstar outlook for this CDFI sector? Yes, Yuri. So our outlook, we see an ongoing interest in the CDFI space, which like other areas of RMBS are constrained by overall market and mortgage specific conditions, such as inflation, recessionary pressures from further rate hikes, widening spreads and capital markets volatility. We note and acknowledge a potential convergence to standards similar to QMATR in the event certain aspects of the revised application are finalized. As mentioned throughout this presentation, tightening of underwriting restrictions may align CDFI loans to certain QM ATR requirements and may limit previously allowed expanded underwriting of income and loan affordability products. DBRS Morningstar will continue to monitor the performance of CDFI loans and the developments in the CDFI space as it relates to trends with originators and potential changes to the application process. Thank you again, Karina and Mark. Um, this concludes our prepared remarks. Um, so now let's open up for, for questions. Let's give it a few seconds before the questions come in. So we have a first question just came in in the chat. Um, I'll address it to both of you. Um, so the presenters spoke generally about uh, some of the collateral characteristics of CDFI. What kind of loan products are you seeing from CDFI lenders? Um, I can I can take that, Yuri. Um, so as we mentioned, you know, there's almost 1,400 CDFI lenders, uh, but we're seeing a smaller number. You know, much smaller number that are actually originating and securitizing um, loans. So in that, we've definitely seen you know the basics of fixed and arms, you know for owner and investor properties, second homes. You know as far as the product types, we have thirty year fixed, fully amortizing, but we have also seen IOs and forty year loans as well. Uh, again, I think it's worth noting that um, predominantly we're speaking about the CDFI pools and their typically involved in the non-QM space as well, but there have been small numbers of CDFI loans included in prime jumbo deals and CDFI production is also sold to GSEs as well. 
Great, thank you, Mark. Um, another question just came in. I'm actually glad the question is being asked. It's important. Um, uh, I saw a recent CDFI deal where the lender didn't use income to qualify the borrowers. How do those borrowers get qualified? Yuri, I'll take I'll take this one. I I knew this question would get asked. <laughs> so the whole mission of CDFI of a CDFI is to target underbanked and underserved communities. And potentially what that means is uh, certain lenders who are CDFIs um, may provide more expanded programs to provide this access to credit. Um, certain borrowers may have saved up, but may not, uh, Mark mentioned this, may not have been able to get a loan through more conventional means. Um, and so the CDFIs that have programs where no income documentation is allowed really review other aspects of the borrower to assess, um, you know, whether they should qualify. And I think I mentioned this a couple times throughout the presentation, but a big one is looking at months of reserves, liquid reserves, also capping LTVs. Um, these lenders also look at mortgage history and then uh, as well as credit scores. And so there are other aspects of the borrowers that those lenders can focus on um, in order to offset that there's no income documentation. Thank you, Karina. Um, and then there's the next question, um, which looks to refer to something we will discuss, but just to clarify, um, at least 60% of the target markets. Is, is that 60%, does it refer to a transaction or a deal or a program, or does the 60% refer to the overall origination from CDFI entity? Um, yeah, I can, I can talk more about that, Yuri. Um, the 60% the requirement for the target market is for the actual CDFI institution itself. Um, so the production in a securitization could be completely from a target market, completely from the other proportion that's not directly related to a target market, um, and even the specific product offered by a CDFI, um, there could be some variance in which product met that requirement versus, um, you know, a certain account or lending product. So um, it, it doesn't have to be within the deal. The deal could be any makeup from 100% of target market to 0%, as long as it was coming from the CDFI institution. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, it looks like our audience is really curious about CDFI institutions. Um, there's another question related to um, to the following: Where are the CDFIs located? Are there any concerns about the geographical location of CDFIs? Uh, yeah, I can talk about that too, Yuri. Um, so there's the CDFIs at this point are in all 50 states, um, as well as Puerto Rico, Guam, and DC. Uh, you know. The top represented states, um, California, Mississippi, um, Louisiana, there's also Puerto Rico is in the top 10, New York is in the top 10, Texas is in the top 10. Um, but this is for the CDFI institutions, not necessarily the um, ones focused on mortgage lending or that we see in securitization. Um, broadly speaking, we have seen in securitizations themselves, you know, high California concentration, which makes sense given that there's um, the most institutions there as well as some of the securitizing originators are based in some of these markets. Um, I think just at, at the other end, um, you know, some states may have as few as just one CDFI. Um, again, it's based on the target markets, remember, so really the demographics of the state, you know, does play a significant role in sort of the the volume of entities and their originations. Thank you, Mark. Um, let us check briefly if there are any other questions in the queue. It seems like we do have a question. Um, while it is a worthy goal to target undeserved borrowers, why is it considered beneficial to those borrowers to not consider the ability to repay? I think we've covered some of it when we discussed sort of the 
the, the, the board membership in the presence of the community members and the governance uh, of this uh, CDFIs. But uh, Karina, Mark, maybe I can turn over to you to uh, help answer this question fully. Sure. Um, so it's interesting, uh, considered beneficial. Um, I'm not sure that uh, it's considered beneficial um, to not consider their ability to repay. But I think for um, mortgage access, uh, you know, you can reach a wide, broader audience. Um, but then the focus for underwriting becomes a little bit uh, uh, different. And I think this is an important uh, point as well as the CDFI fund looks to um, implement some of their changes, because I think that's probably some of the aspects that they look to address just based on the proposed changes. Um, so some of the proposed changes essentially create these mortgage protections that could potentially um, make CDFI loans um, look very similar to QM ATR. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Mark? Yeah, I could, um, you know, I think, I think I want to also mention, you know, ability to repay kind of capital A, capital T, capital R as a regulation. Um, that's very specific. So being exempt from the ATR does not mean that the originator is not actively interested in the borrower repaying their loan. Um, the credit underwriting is still done. Obviously, basic credit metrics, um, you know, are looked at. Um, and it, it really goes back to that community focus and the oversight from those institutions um, and the expanded credit that they, those target members in the accountability through oversight are making sure that their target market um, constituents are not being harmed. Um, and so again, just making sure obviously the loans are originated with the intention for them to be repaid. It's just not necessarily ATR, the regulation ATR. Thank you. Um, I think the answer is fairly clear. Um, we do have a couple of other questions here. Um, one related to, um, can you discuss average loan rate spread in the context of comparable non-QM loans, create enhancements, e.g. access spread of subordination? As a rating agency, we're fairly remote from uh, you know, pricing of the loans and so forth, but, but perhaps um, we can speak a little bit about uh, sort of a how to cut as a credit enhancement, perhaps for investment grade classes in the rated CDFI deals sure. uh, compare yeah, with, uh, with those in non-QM. Yeah, definitely, Yuri. And I think also it's a little bit tough because I, as I mentioned, um, you know, there aren't a lot of 100% CDFI transactions. So you can see CDFI loans in a traditional non-QM transaction. Um, and in those cases, uh, you know, the the structure is kind of a non-QM structure, the, the pro rata to the seniors and sequential pay. Um, so it's hard to compare. Um, like credit enhancements because the structures are a little bit different. Um, I would say that uh, typically for the CDFI, 100% CDFI transactions that we've seen in the recent past, it, you know, uh, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but the the rates are tend to be um, a bit higher. Great, thank you, Karina. That makes sense. Obviously, the differences in structure with kind of warrant to differences in credit enhancements, so it's not necessarily you know, direct apples to apples comparison. Um, but thank you for clarifying that. Um, uh, we do have an ESG question. It seems like no conversation around structured products goes without ESG one way or the other. Um, the question is how does ESG play into the demand for CDFI securitizations? Um, I'm not sure we can directly address the demand. Again, it's more of a uh, perhaps dealer uh, related question, um, but uh, perhaps we can speak at a high level to the ESG sure. considerations for CDFIs. Yeah, absolutely, Yuri. So um, you nailed it. Uh, so, you know, we as a rating agency aren't really designating social bond, you know, we're, we're not the ones uh, putting social bond designations on these transactions. There are separate independent companies that do that. Um, you know, we can talk about ESG in terms of our credit analysis. Um, so in our credit analysis, we do assess uh, social risk factors that could affect uh, collateral defaults and recovery rates. 
Um, and if there are social factors that may not be reflected in performance data, we can evaluate how that could impact credit performance through some quantitative analysis, sensitive sensitivity testing in our model. Um, generally, uh, just generally, as we look at ESG, we try to understand if there is an extraordinarily positive or negative social impact on, uh, on the borrowers or even society. And also if these characteristics result in, in different losses than what our models are, are suggesting. Um, in the case of the CDFI pools that we've reviewed, We've not really made any adjustments from the model to account for social factors, uh, since we believe that the, you know, certain characteristics that result from being a CDFI loan. So, for example, no income documentation, you know, that's already being assessed in our loss model. Uh, thank you, Karina. Um, there's another question, more again, more related to sort of the expected demand or expected volume of this transaction. Um, the question is, do you expect to see an increase in 100% CDFI pools? Why and why not? Again, this is perhaps a little bit more aligned with the uh, um, dealer community that brings these transactions to the market. Um, but perhaps we can speak maybe at a high level of our expectation for a CDFI as a product. Yeah, again, Yuri, I think you, you hit it with um, saying that we may not be exactly the entity that would appropriately answer this question. Um, but I, I imagine that 100% uh, CDFI pools would continue through next year. Thank you, Karina. <clears throat> At this point, we do not have any other questions in the queue. Um, we'd like to thank you very much, Karina Mark, for an excellent presentation. Um, this concludes our webinar. Thank you very much for attending, and thank you very much for a very lively Q&A discussion and asking the questions. Um, in attending the webinar. 